So for our next speaker, we're going to be hearing from a really good friend of mine, Colleen Campbell. She's a PhD student here at KAUST at the Red Sea Research Center. She's going to be discussing using drones, fluid lensing, and network analysis to get coral reef mapping in the Red Sea. So without further ado, please welcome Colleen. My name is uh, Colleen Campbell, um, like uh, Ryan was saying, I'm a PhD student in the Reef Ecology Lab in the Red Sea Research Center of KAUST. Um, I did my undergrad and master's in geography, and I'm using drones to capture images that allow me to do fluid lensing and network analysis uh, to get a more accurate representation of coral reefs. Um, while many of you are making and improving robotics, um, that's not at all what I do, um, I'd like to show you um, one way that we are using them in field, um, maybe so you can get um, a better uh, idea of how you can improve robotics um, uh, for, for usage. Um, this background image here on this slide was actually taken with a drone um, in the Red Sea um, of a coral reef here. So many of you have never been on a marine science research trip. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about it. Um, this is a picture of Millie. Um, she's carrying several measuring tapes and a camera and she's um, about to put on all of her scuba gear. Um, and she will be taking, um, she'll dive at a nearby reef and lay down that tape um, and begin photographing the area. Um, she has a limited amount of time to do that, um, and she only has a specific task that she'll be doing. Uh, during this dive, she's looking for coral bleaching and taking photos of that bleaching. Currently, it is best for marine scientists to go out in the field and make observations like this. Um, some measurements can only be done by a person. However, this has pros and cons. There are limited people aboard this vessel, like um, and each task has to be done in pairs, and each pair is given a specific task. Um, the research will be done in an hour or two, and then the boat leaves to go to another location. Um, it is physically and mentally draining. Additionally, only a small section of the reef can be covered, as a person can only swim so far. Additionally, each re research trips like this aren't that common because they are very expensive and difficult um, to, to book. Um, we only do a few of them uh, a year and they're, um, so it's quite um, costly and also important to get as much information as we can get in each um, trip. So this brings us to how we supplement our in-person or in-situ monitoring of the reefs. Um, we use remote sensing techniques, and I'm going to discuss a little bit about the history of remote sensing. However, hopefully this will be of interest to you as it uh, may spark some ways you can help marine science with remote sensing and robotics. So the first aerial photographs were taken by Gaspar Felix Tournachon, a French photographer. He used a hot air balloon and the pseudonym of Nadar, which is now photograph. A photogrammetry term. This was done to get a great pictures of the city, but the hot air balloon photograph technique was also used in the American Civil War for reconnaissance. These were the main applications of remote sensing in the beginning. Great photos and uh, rec recon. Carrier pigeons were also trained to fly missions and then later airplane missions were flown. While great pictures and recon are still applications used today, our cameras have improved and our emissions have broadened. Airplane remote sensing is still used today, mainly for mapping purposes, um, usually using multispectral cameras and LIDAR. Um, still challenges exist with airplanes, um, such as missions have to be scheduled um, and they can be quite costly. They also uh, can't go in every area. Um, this brings us to satellite imagery. In the 1970s, uh, NASA started the Landsat program. Uh, the Landsat satellite goes around the Earth every two weeks, which means that there's consistent satellite imagery for the majority of the planet since the 1970s, which I think is amazing. Uh, the imagery uses multispectral cameras. Um, the Landsat 
is considered a thematic mapper. That means that it not only picks up uh, images, but it has bands which have a theme or a specific band that it photographs in, um, such as uh, a blue band or an infrared band. Um, these can be used for different purposes, such as geology, um, agriculture, regional planning, forestry, and surveillance. Um, in marine science, satellite imagery can be used to detect coastal changes um, and ocean temperature and color, which can help monitor things like algal outbreaks. While Landsat and other satellite programs are amazing, they have some drawbacks. It is difficult and expensive to refocus the satellite for a specific event. Um, also, the resolution for satellites is good for large areas. It's not fine enough in detail for coral reefs. The current Landsat satellite resolution is at 30 meters, which is too large to detect some reefs. And some of the reefs that we visited on that uh, trip that you saw a million in October are not visible from satellite images. So they don't even show up on Google Earth. So we can't see every reef. It is also impossible to detect uh, individual corals from uh, satellite imagery. Which brings us uh, to drones. Drone technology, as many of you know, is evolving so that it has many capabilities. One of those things is that it makes drones so useful as their ability to be modified. Um, some drones are large while others are small. Uh, a variety of cameras and sensors can be added um, to, to the drones, um, including like hyperspectral cameras and LIDAR. These modifications and portability of drones make them ideal for field work where space and time are limited. Drones are now being used for mapping um, places that were previously too small uh, for an airplane or satellite to pick up. There's also a cost-effective method for mapping, especially for researchers or small businesses that may not have a large enough budget for airplane monitoring. When it comes to flying an airplane for reef mapping, I'm not even sure how we would organize that, especially in the Red Sea. Um, so make, taking drones out for field work um, make it capable for mapping and imagery to be taken that wouldn't uh, otherwise be done. There are plenty of pluros and cons to drones, especially when it comes to working with water, as you will see in the next slide. So this is a video taken from the, the trip in October. Um, this is in the Red Sea um, by Yambu, Saudi Arabia. Notice that the reef is made up of patches, some which are not above the water. Um, a coral reef is complex area, just like any other habitat, like a forest. Um, you can see here some other of the challenges that are presented by working with drone imagery on the water. Um, notice how the light glints off of the surface of the water and the waves move, making ripples. This can obscure information when trying to analyze the imagery. Our eyes can easily pick out the information where there is reef and where there is not, but when using software for mapping and machine learning, those glints and waves can be an issue. We need to find out better ways of removing these problems without, using, without causing distortion and maintaining the information of the reef. One of those methods um, is called fluid lensing. This is a relatively new technique um, invented by Ved Chiriath in 2016. Here is an, ex an example of that fluid lensing that he has done. Um, while this doesn't seem dramatic, um, between slide uh, from image one and image three. Um, the first image has light and distortion throughout all of this imagery. Um, and then as we see through to this third um, image that has been lensed and, and 3D mapped, we can see here the um, small sea stars. This um, gives us an example of seeing corals more clearly and how we can monitor what lives on the reef. As I mentioned earlier, um, Millie was only doing one task when she was doing her, her survey, and that was um, looking at bleaching. So a researcher can only do one task at a time and only can see one small section of the reef at a time. So even if Millie were, saw a fish or a sea star um, like this one, she didn't record it. She only recorded what she was looking for. Drone imagery is able to take into that, take in that information, which can be used for a variety of projects. Um, this third image is also 3D mapped, which gives us more information about the reef. 
Um, and we can ask questions about size and volume of reefs in a way that we couldn't um, before. And we can do it from our laptops instead of just being when we're on the reef. So how does fluid lensing work? Let's take a look at this first image. So this is taken from a fountain at um, Discovery in Kaos. Um, it's a normal image of what we might see at a fountain or, or water. If you look here, you can see ripples from waves and some glints from the light um, that, that are happening and some distortion. Um, the second image here is the same, same area. It's just been processed, it's been lensed. Um, and you can see um, that there is now the tiles underneath that water. And you can see more detail than you would before. Um, obviously, this, there's not any fish or anything in the, in the fountain, but it's to give an example of how it works. It's not, this isn't done with a single image. Um, fluid lensing takes uh, multiple images and it's not done um, yet discovered how to do this with a single image. The, um, the same is done with a drone, even though this was taken with multiple images, the drone also takes multiple images or it is done with a video, which is then sliced into multiple images. Um, so this comes into one of our first issues with drones or processing. Taking multiple images at each location for an entire reef is very time consuming and battery draining. However, taking a video and slicing it into um, multiple images is a high computational expense. So maybe, um, that is one way that we can work with robotics to make that process easier. So what does this mean for coral reef mapping? When using satellite imagery, we're, we aren't able to get a clear view, not just because of the distance, but due to wave distortion. If we look in this picture here, we see the difference um, in scale. So if we look at this photo, the distortion happens from one centimeter to 10, 10 meters, a lot of detail is lost. Um, and that is just coming from, from wave, wave distortion and problems uh, that come with just working with water. Um, when we see uh, drone images coming back with high accuracy, we're able to classify those images and create better models. This means that even though the researcher is only at the reef for an hour or two, they're able to do much more, see more, much more of the reef and have access to those images in the lab, which allows for long-term studies to happen. On the top um, image here, there is a zoomed in picture of a coral reef um, and it is taken from the trip in October. And this is done at a 20 meter height from the drone. Um, and we're able to zoom in and able to see details of the, of the coral. We can actually see the individual branches of the coral, which is pretty amazing, and you're able to do some identification from that. Um, the bottom uh, image here is a classification of that same reef, um, and it was classified using um, supervised machine learning classification. Basically, what that means is that I told the computer when you see pixels that look like this, that it's white coral, or pixels that look like this, it's a purple coral. Um, and that uh, this pixels is water over here. And so um, machine learning is a great tool for classifying large areas like we might see in a coral reef. Um, if a person had to classify that by hand, um, it would take a very long time. Um, in this method, a researcher can validate the machine learning classification, um, which is repeatable and much quicker and reduces human error. The algorithm was also told to classify anything that I hadn't told it to. Like I, if I said, oh, I didn't get all of these pixels, I told it to pick some other things out as well. So you can see here that there's some uh, extra blue in the, in the water. And you can also see here on the corals that there's some extra little glints. And those are from the, white, the light and the wave distortion. Um, so fluid lensing reduces that error and makes this have um, without the, the distortions um, and, and picks up only classifications that are the coral or the water. Okay, so no reef is the same. So let's look at this for a moment. 
here we have a very close up image of a reef that has been um, 3D'd. Um, we can see that the reef isn't flat, it has bumps and curves, and it does still have some flat areas. Um, measuring this bumpiness or complexity is called uh, rugosity. Um, because the reef is made up of corals and each coral can look different and be in different positions um, and have different placement, that's why we say no reef is the same. Not only do corals differ, but the animals that live there, like fish and sharks and rays, also differ depending on the region and other factors. We are looking at how and where each coral is and how it relates to the environment around it. One potential habitat use that we can see from drone imagery is um, probably not what you think. Um, you may not know that um, some fish do agriculture and farm uh, on the reef. They farm algae and make small little patches of farms. Um, so one way we're looking, one ongoing project in our, in our lab is looking at fish usage of reef and how much of the reef is being farmed by these particular uh, species. The coral reef um, is not just a reef alone. Um, that reef is in a water, which means it has um, properties that affect the reef. Um, many of these uh, properties are collected using a variety of sensors, um, which are then used, which those of you doing robotics might be able to improve and optimize um, using GIS or geographic information systems. I take the different layers that we have available. Each of these layers can be made into a raster or a grid format. Um, imagery is already in a raster format um, as an image is made up of lots of little pixels. All of these pixels can um, on the all of these pixels on each of the grids contains information, um, which then can be added together using map algebra to create a more realistic view of um, or a holistic view of the area. A variety of analysis can then be performed with that output. One of those is cost analysis. This can be a tricky concept to understand, so I'm gonna take you out of the ocean for a minute. This is Jane. She has a house here in the background. Um, what is the cost of living at her house? So you might say it's a mortgage, which would be true. Um, that is one of the costs of living in a house. But there are other costs like bills and uh, like food. You can probably think of a few other things that she might have to pay um, besides these bills up here. How does Jane pay for these costs? Um, hopefully with a pretty good salary um, that she has money left over to do other things, which leads us to another set of costs. Um, is there a gym nearby or a movie theater, a place to hike or swim? Are there friends that she might um, hang out with? Are these costs like, and it seems like, yeah, those are costs, but it's not necessarily paid for in money. Uh, these costs kind of compound. If Jane is lonely, then she has um, a greater cost to living in that area. But if she has a lot of fun things to do, it lessens the cost to living in that area. Finally, um, what if Jane lives in a neighborhood with a lot of robberies? Maybe she doesn't feel safe or the local school is underperforming. She doesn't think her kids are getting a good education or there might not be doctors in the nearby, so her health suffers. These are all different costs and they all impact the way that Jane lives in different ways. In the marine environment, we see similar costs. While fish don't have a mortgage to pay, they do have look for a suitable place to live. Some of those parameters are easily added together like Jane's bills, but others are compounded in ways that we can only know how much impact is made by doing statistical analysis. Some parameters we may look for are like temperature, not just the daily temperature, but uh, global warming and how that affects the reef over time. Um, other factors might be proximity to um, factories or um, developed areas and how that might be affecting the reefs. These costs that we can see might be additive. So think of Jane's bills or antagonistic, think of her salary, which covers some of those costs. Um, or synergistic, think of the other costs, whether they were good or bad. 
these reefs can be given a score of the level of cost it takes to live in that reef. So why do we want to know that score? So just like Jane lives, doesn't live in a house with nothing around it, reefs, um, while seem individual, aren't surrounded by nothing. They are water and all of that water is connected to other reefs in the area. Uh, you can see this picture of this reef, that's Abu Gulawa. Um, you can see in the background, there are other reefs back here. Um, so these reefs are connected in some way. In this case, it's proximity. Um, water between, moves between these reefs pretty easily. Um, but we don't know exactly all the characteristics of these reefs. Um, though, because they're close together, they're probably very similar. Um, we also don't know everything about why a coral or a fish chooses to um, live in a certain area. Uh, but we can look at parameters such as like currents and um, healthiness of a reef to help us determine some reasons a fish or a coral might live in a place. We also want to know the cost of living in that, that reef. Will the fish um, or coral do well in the area? And so as we give that cost, um, like we did for Jane's neighborhood, will we give this cost for these reefs? So maybe Abu Galawa is a good reef. Maybe this reef isn't so great. Maybe this reef is just okay. So we can do, um, uh, we, can, we can look at those to see how, how the reefs are doing. Unfortunately, we cannot sample every reef in the Red Sea um, due to a variety of reasons, such as time, um, the location, maybe in a sensitive area, or um, it's in another country who has different rev regulations for, for surveying. Um, I plan on making a network of the reefs that I can sample um, to better understand how the coral and fish recruits will survive and thrive under variety um, conditions. Um, I think robotics would be great in helping solve some of the sampling issues um, involved in time and effort uh, of looking at these reefs. Okay, as we look at these networks made of reefs and how they are connected to each other, we can start to answer some questions. We learn more scientific knowledge about the reef, such as what animals inhabit that area. We can look at deeper into things like bacteria and algae, which are vital for the overall health of the reef. We can also know how fish and coral will be growing and changing as climate events, such as natural events like El Nino happen or anthropogenic events such as climate change will affect the reefs. We also will be able to monitor how resilient those reefs will be during these events. We want to know where new fish and coral recruits will go. Will they be able to survive in their reef? Um, will they be able to re reproduce? Will they live long and healthy lives? So what are some of the applications of knowing this information about where fish and coral recruits will go? So an MPA is a marine protected area um, and they are of large concern for our oceans. Um, Saudi Arabia is looking at protecting areas um, for example, uh, NEOM, the Red Sea Project, and Amala are some of the protected areas in the Red Sea. However, you might think that you can just pick any reef or sets of reef and be like, hey, that'll work for protection. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, you need to take uh, a variety of habitats. And even though it seems like a coral reef is all one habitat, each, um, each coral reef is different. And so there are different habitats even with inside different coral reefs. It's important to use information we get from these networks to know which reefs have the best potential to thrive um, when protected. When we have good uh, information about these areas, we can know better how to protect them as well as to create long-term monitoring. Some of that long-term monitoring can be done with robotics. Uh, a marine protected area gives uh, better fishing for adjacent and non-protected areas. Many protected areas uh, are used for tourism and have, beautiful reef, and have beautiful reefs. And these reefs, as we know, are important for overall health of the planet. We need sensors to monitor how that reef is faring. Asking in a statistical way, is the reef getting healthier? Is there an improved amount of fish? Are corals returning from bleach state to a healthy state? So you might be thinking, all of this is great, Colleen, but I'm not a fish or coral person. I don't know anything about that. Um, you don't need to know everything about fish or coral to help or to um, create 
a way to Im uh, improve sampling. Um, I went through this whole process of my research so I could show you how people are working in the field and what data they plan to, connect, to collect. I thought of some ways that robotics uh, may help in this situation. For example, rotterproofing drones would make things a lot easier. Right now, if a drone falls from the sky, we lose it and all of its data, even if it can be recovered by a diver. While um, we are out doing uh, drone flights, um, we generally don't have Wi-Fi, so pulling up maps uh, to create new flight isn't possible. Having a drone uh, that can sense where a reef is and make a map on the fly would be amazing. Uh, changing batteries often is an issue as well. As I mentioned, if we lose a drone, it's a real problem, so we don't use much of the battery before calling it back and switching it out. Um, lensing, as I mentioned, is either battery or time heavy or computational heavy. So be making that somehow easier would be great. Sensors are very important for long-term monitoring. We have a variety of sensors uh, now, such as temperature loggers and devices that measure currents. However, there are challenges that are facing these sensors. Um, one is that sometimes sensors move in the water. Um, I was doing field work last night and a sensor um, that had been placed to measure current had flipped over um, and was potentially not uh, measuring currents any longer. We won't know until we take it into the lab. Um, another problem is that GPS is not available underwater. So when we do sensing for animals, we only get a presence absence data and not a precise location. Another huge problem facing sensors is biofouling. Um, sensors get covered in algae and debris, making it no longer functional. Making sensors that are resistant to that would be um, very useful. Um, finally, safety for divers is a big concern. Uh, here you see Laura, she's drilling uh, coral cores. Um, that's a coral that is dead actually, and she's looking to see its life um, in the core. Um, it's a process that takes a very long time. It's very demanding. Um, you can see a couple of divers in the background, they switch off um, and take turns. Um, Anytime you add water to a task, whether it's drilling in the situation or even counting the fish, um, it makes things more dangerous. Um, divers are going through a very physically uh, and mentally demanding process. Um, so limiting their potential danger um, is one way that robotics can improve um, marine, marine science. Um, safety measures that I can think of as making scuba safer or making tools um, for collection of samples easier. Um, often drills or hammers and chisels are used um, for underwater collection. So in summary, even though we will always need uh, in situ monitoring of reefs that is limited by an area of research, a uh, researcher is able to see um, in one dive, as well as the ability of such research trips to return to that reef, Drone monitoring allows for more area to be studied and hopefully more options for returning to the reefs as it is lower cost um, than just sending divers. There is a lot of challenges uh, to working with marine environments that don't necessarily occur with land. One of those is light refraction issues. Um, fluid lensing helps remove that distortion and allows for 3D mapping to occur and from uh, drone, occur from drone imagery. Uh, cost analysis models can give more holistic view of the reef, which lets us know how easy or difficult it is for species of coral and fish to survive through the, at that reef. These reefs can be made into a network which can show how these reefs are connected to each other, as well as the environment around them. This lets us know when there is a spawning event, if these recruits are likely to go and how they will, be, how they will do and survive. Marine protected areas can be designed based on the information gained from monitoring, which gives the reefs the best chance to be successful and sensors can aid in long-term monitoring. Um, I would like to thank my PI, Dr. Michael Baruman um, from the Reef Ecology Lab. I would also like to thank those who participated in the October 2020 um, field research trip and especially to Dr. Aaron Fer Eric Farron from the Risk Lab for inviting me to speak at this conference. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Colleen, for that really interesting talk. It's, it's always very eye-opening to see what the applications are of the drones that we work on in the RISC lab. So thank you so much.